Welcome to the Marquette Hoops Basketball Show. I'm John Pearson in for Tom Pippins, who's off being the nicest man in the world somewhere else here. So, uh, so glad to be stepping here along with the historian and basically the man who loves Marquette basketball as much as anybody in the world, John Dodds. And John, great to see you. Uh, today we're going to have, uh, pick it up again with Ben Steele. He's uh, covered Marquette basketball since 2017, does a great job. Uh, all the Marquette fans appreciate his hard work. And uh, we had him on uh, two months ago when we uh, started to show up again this year, but we wanted to uh, get him on again, talk about uh, Tyler Kolick, also Iguodaro going pro, and then uh, really the end of the year uh, lost to North Carolina State. And of course, our show is brought to you by Moonlight Graham Modern Dental Benefits. We're so excited to have them be a part of it. And now let's hear from Ben Steele. Well, when you want to learn Marquette basketball, you do need to know who to ask about it. And the guy that's followed him pretty much uh, every day of his life for the last several years is Ben Steele from the Journal Sentinel, the Marquette beat guy. And John and I are now joined by Ben. And a little bit of news this week is uh, Tyler Kolek and Oso Aguidaro both <laughs> are headed to the NBA, not exactly surprises, but uh, just talk a little bit about now that that's all official and put in the background a little bit, where do you see Marquette? And talk a little bit also about what those two guys brought to this program. Yeah, both those guys, they're the last two guys on the Marquette team that had that fifth year of NCAA eligibility that, that they could use. Um, Oso, he said before the season, he was unlikely to use it. He's already got two degree, or he's getting a second degree as we speak. From Marquette, so he, had, I think he had done everything he could in four years. Uh, Tyler, the same thing. Like he, you know, two-time back-to-back consensus All-American. I think it was time for him. He was ready to take the next challenge and in his and and try for that that ultimate dream, that professional NBA dream that that every basketball player dreams about. It's right there for him. I think both those guys have a shot at being. Uh, late first round picks, early second round picks. I mean, it depends. There's a long way to go in the pre-draft process. A lot of things can shake out. A lot of things can change, as we saw with Omax Prosper last season. Uh, but as far as what both those guys meant for the for the program, I mean, those guys were foundational pieces of what Shaka Smart has built these last three years. Um, like you think about when Shaka came in as coach in April 2001, mm -hmm. I remember hearing the name Tyler Kolick I'd never seen him play. He was, I mean, he had some success at, at George Mason. You know, he was the newcomer of the year in his conference. Um, but I didn't know if he could make the leap to the next level. And, you know, he's proved beyond a doubt that, that Marquette coaches saw something in him. And then all the improvements that he made of, with himself for the game. Um, Oso Iguodaro, I mean, the dramatic improvement in his game, I, he's got to be, one of the most improved players in, in Marquette basketball history. Talk about a guy that played like 38 minutes as a freshman, and now he's he's leaving as a potential first-round NBA draft pick four years later. It's pretty crazy. Uh, but what those guys meant, those guys were just, like I said, foundational pieces to what, what Shaka has built this last couple of years. One thing with uh, Tyler that's always interesting, he always makes the right basketball play, and it was interesting watching that NC State game. You almost wanted him not to. Like he needed to maybe be the guy that scores. It he kept making the right pass, and then they'd mm -hmm. miss, and that kind yeah. of burned him a little bit. Does have you heard, or has Tyler maybe heard, maybe being able to do a little bit more, being willing to do something where it's maybe it's not the perfect basketball play, but maybe to take that next step where ooh, you look up and he has 22 instead of 12 and 10 assists in a game. Well, I think what. NBA teams like about Tyler from what I've heard from scouts throughout the year is that they like that he makes the right decision yeah. every time. Um, and when you get to the NBA level, I mean, you're playing with obviously a lot better players. So when you make that, that those better choices, uh, you know, that the lead to probably more success. If you hit open guys at the NBA level, they tend to knock those shots down. Um, so I think, you know, that decision making is probably Tyler's biggest strength as a player. And I think he'll, he'll I think he'll have a nice career as like a competent backup point guard. Those guys are valuable at the NBA level. Those guys are hard to find um, guys that can come in and run a team, settle teams down. And those, you know, second and, and third quarters when when teams are making runs and and it's a long season. You need guys that are just competent point guards. And, and Tyler is certainly that way beyond competence. So I, I think you'll find a place in the NBA. 
know, it's interesting. Last night, we uh, while we're taping this, last night was the basketball banquet, and Ben, we missed you. You're the hardest working guy in uh, show business. Uh, <laughs> you were at the you were at the Bucks. Uh, you were working the Bucks Orlando game last night. Yeah. But uh, uh, Shaka made a point that's basically said um, when Tyler Cola came to Marquette, there was no way anybody thought he would be an NBA talent. He was a two guard from George Mason and he gave credit to Cody Hatt, who Cody Hatt has this assistant coach has a uh, interesting network where he finds these mm -hmm. guys. And he said, there's a guy you might want to get as a point guard. And I even at the, at the event last night, I even spoke to Tyler Kolick's mom. And I said, I was really surprised when he came here. I thought we were getting a two guard. Right catch and shoot guy and she said that's how they wanted to use him at george mason but he's always been a point guard and cody had mm -hmm. knew that and brought him in and then shaka also said that when he when he came uh to marquette he looked at oso and oso had i think played 38 minutes the the year before and there was no one that thought he had an nba chance as a prospect and he so he kind of grouped both of them and how proud he was of what they've done. They've made themselves into NBA players or prospects over the last uh, three years. Yeah, I think uh, what's interesting about both those guys uh, and tying that in with, with what Chaka and, and his coaching staff saw in those guys, what I think this coaching staff's really good at is they watch these players, like they get the players in. They've talked about this a lot that like they'll just watch like, five on five games for like 30 minutes at the Al McGuire center, watch the players play and just pick up specific skill sets. Like this is how like Oso and, and cam when they run those two band games on, on the side and play off each other, that, that all stems from like watching those guys in practice and putting those guys in those positions during the game and then like building off those skills, seeing what those guys are good at. So I think like they didn't know that Tyler was going to be this, you know, savant level, decision maker at the point guard position, but just watching them in the pickup games and, and incorporating some of that into, into the system. I, I think that's, uh, I, they, they, they saw the vision there and they built upon that. And, and, you know, Tyler deserves, you know, the lion's share of the credit just for building himself into that kind of player with the, with his work ethic, but the coaching system, the coaching staff definitely, um, deserves a, de deserves credit just for, just for seeing the initial vision. And Shaka, Shaka Smart doesn't exactly need my uh, approval, but, you know, he doesn't lean on that transfer portal and seeing these two guys who could have been just locked in as role players who uh, don't take that next step. He was about developing guys and a lot, everybody talks transfer portal, but seeing these two guys take the steps they did because their coach and staff stuck with them does does that uh, maybe speak to that a little bit that as time goes on and he develops guys, Marquette's going to be able to take that next step because guys like this took their next step. Right. It's very, very rare in the, the era in college basketball that, that we're living in right now. Guys that, you know, maybe struggle, like Tyler struggled shooting his first year. And, you know, he took some criticism for that. His first season at Marquette, I should say, um, struggled shooting the ball. Um, Maybe you guys would uh, look for a better uh, better landing spot or, or, or a place where, you know, they wouldn't face that kind of criticism. But uh, both those guys stuck with it. And I think it helps the coaching staff that they can point to those guys as success stories, right? Like these guys stuck with it. Uh, yeah. They went through struggles and look where they are now. So I think that's why in the last couple of years, you don't see the transfers out from Marquette that you see at other places. Cause the, you know, the coaches can tell like Trey Norman, like, you know, Tyler had his struggles too. And look where he ended up or, you know, big guys like Al Amadou who, who didn't play that much let this year as, as a freshman, they, they could say, Oh, so he he only played 30 minutes as a freshman. Now look where he's at. So it, it just gives those stories and kind of reinforces um, that kind of program that they have. Last night, Shaka related a story that, when he took over, uh, he had recruited Oso out of Phoenix to Texas. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, he turned me down and, you know, I kind of got some chuckles or whatever with the, with the crowd. But he said that, uh, 
Greg Elliott was, was hurt at the time, uh -huh. and so was Justin Lewis. And the only person there who could work with the coaches was Oso. So all four yeah. coaches basically had a lot of time on their hands and just one player. And they said yeah. they sent him through drills. And Shaka always talked about the drill where he put – one ball on one block and one ball on the yeah. other, and he would go back and yeah. forth and, and dunk. It's one of the toughest drills for a big man. And also, he said, had over 50 dunks before he, you know, fell over exhausted or whatever. Yeah. And he, re he really said that, and he also related, and I assume he was, he didn't say Dawson Garcia, but I think he, he probably, it was Dawson Garcia, was saying how, you know, he didn't, really want to come back to Marquette because the team wasn't going to be that good. And <laughs> he looked at Oso and those guys. And now Shaka just pointed out that I'm not saying who this was, but Oso is now better than that guy as a prospect mm -hmm. leading to the NBA. And that was, uh, that was interesting. Yeah. It's funny when you think about Oso coming in, he was like the most unheralded member of that, that recruiting class with Dawson and, and Justin Lewis um, Dexter Cano, right? He was part of that class. I, yeah, right. My, my years are getting confused here. Um, no. but yeah, I, I remember when Oso signed with Marquette. Um, I obviously didn't know a lot about him, him being from the Phoenix area. Um, I talked to like his AU coach and his AU coach like swore up and down. This guy has like Scotty Pippen level skills. Now you always, no. when you talk to AU coaches, they always, you know, they're going to pump their own guys up. That's, that's part of the gig. Um, but I, you know, this guy, I could tell by the way he was talking, like he honestly believed it. And I was like, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about this guy. He's not like a highly, like highly rated recruit at all. Um, but you want it, you see him now and you can see that coming to fruition, like that skill set. That's why NBA teams are intrigued by him. Like he can guard multiple, multiple positions, six eleven, long athletic, um, and you talk about Oso's work ethic. It's the same thing as Tyler that I was talking about before. Like he added something every year while he was at Marquette, uh, whether it's that ball handling, you know, or, or the passing vision or th that two man game that he worked with Tyler or with uh, Cam and, and, and Stevie Mitchell, they would, those guys work really hard on that chemistry. Um, so I think that's why NBA teams are, are fascinated by Oso is that, you know, the, the knock on four-year players is, is that they plateaued already. But I, I don't think anyone can look at Oso as a player and, and think that he's reached his potential as a player. I think there's multiple levels that he can get to. Yeah, Oso but, seems like the kind of guy who three years from now will be watching a playoff game and you'll see five assists and nine rebounds and – and it'll be that moment, which it seems like a lot of Marquette guys get that when the uh, media will see mm -hmm. them like, oh, he went to Marquette too? There's a lot of those guys out there. Yeah. What is, I guess, the next step where <clears throat> maybe a star player, somebody is starring in the NBA, are they kind of on the verge of that with the recruiting they have, the talent level they have? You don't want it to be, oh, it's a surprise that they went to Marquette. You want it to be the selling point of Marquette is look at what we've done to develop mm -hmm. these guys. Yeah. I think when you look at the recruits that Marquette's got coming in next year, like Royce Parham and Demarius Owens, both those guys are like six, eight guys, multi, you know, multi-skilled, um, got that look of that positionless style that that's, that's yeah. in vogue in basketball, especially at the NBA level, like, big guys who can handle the ball, step outside, shoot it. Guys like Oso who can initiate plays and be a playmaker at, as an assist guy. Um, so I think you're starting to see that with the recruits that, that Shock is bringing. And he definitely, he, you could tell those guys have a type, you know, six, seven, six, eight, multi-skilled guys like that. I want to ask you uh, about uh, uh, the NCAA tournament, the uh, UConn, uh, won it, and it wasn't surprising, really, to any Marquette people or few people that no. follow Marquette. And what a, what a gauntlet Marquette played this year in terms of a schedule, because we saw Purdue in uh, yeah. you saw him firsthand in Maui, then you saw mm -hmm. uh, UConn up close three times. Talk a little bit about uh, 
UConn and uh, were you surprised that the Big East didn't get more than three teams? Uh, I was surprised a little bit. I mean, factoring in the bid thieves with the with the Big East teams, um, I thought Seton Hall probably had the best chance. I thought they should have been in over Virginia. With the bid thieves, it's not surprising that maybe St. John's or Providence didn't make the cut. But I did think Seton Hall should be in there. Um, yeah, this yeah. Was I surprised by UConn? I that this UConn team this year. I thought last year's team was really good, but this year's UConn team was probably, you know, I've been covering Marquette since 2017, and the best teams I've seen in person was that that first that 2017 2018 Villanova team, you know, with yeah. Jalen Brunson, Dante Vincenzo, and the D Vincenzo and those guys. Before this UConn team this year, that was the best team I've ever seen in person at the at the college level, uh, but this year's UConn team was just so tough. And they could beat you in multiple ways. Uh, they had big guys, you know, they, they they got big guys bringing in off the bench like Samson Johnson, who plays a completely different style than than Donovan Klingon. They got like the ultimate glue guy and the like Cam Spencer who can shoot it and and NBA athletes and Stephen Castle and 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 Tristan Newton. Um, so I was not surprised at all that that UConn just rolled, you know, winning every NCAA tournament game by double digits. Um but that you know that 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 speaks to to where the Big East is, is is right now. You got three Sweet Sixteen teams in there. Um, both all three of those teams, UConn, Marquette, and, and um, Connecticut, should be should be good again next year. So the strength of the Big East, like you know, people wrote, wrote off the conference a long time ago, but uh, it hasn't gone anywhere. And uh, how important is it that the culture at Marquette is UConn being here is a an opportunity as opposed to. Oh, what are we supposed to do? UConn is here. Uh, talk a little bit about, because the Big East, obviously, it's going to continue to improve. And now that there is that team. You can point to that and say, we can chase this. This is what we're after. Uh, Marquette can point to success it had against UConn last year, you know, beating them at Madison Square Garden in the semifinals of the, the Big East tournament. The last team to beat Marquette or beat UConn last season before they won the national championship. But yeah, I'm, I firmly believe that that rising tide lifts all boats, you know, with, with having a national champion in your conference. It's interesting. You compare that, uh, UConn team to G Wright's uh, 2017, 2018 team. I was doing that most of the year because that G Wright team and the UConn team had one thing in common. They would have six to eight guys that could launch threes from all over the court and all of a sudden it would come in a wave i mean who mm -hmm. they, they they beat a very good illinois team they had that third that i think the key to that game was that 30 to nothing run uh, to start <laughs> yeah. the game. Yeah. it was like yeah. it was just amazing what, what what they did but those two teams were are comparable and jay wright won two championships in three years and now here's danny hurley back to back yeah, that Villanova team probably is a little better three-point shooting team, but like I said, this UConn team, they also had like a seven foot two, seven foot three guy inside and and played probably a little bit tougher defense than that Villanova team. That Villanova team could just bomb you out of a game. I remember they they beat Marquette in the Big East tournament and it was it was close for a little while, and then I think uh Villanova ended up hitting like ten or twelve threes in the second half and just won by like twenty-five. Um, so they were a little, probably a little better shooting team, but this UConn team just had a little extra toughness, a little extra edge. And I think they get that from that, that coaching, like Jay Wright's a little more suave kind of guy. Uh, Danny Hurley's got that, that edge and he definitely, his team kind of feeds off that a little bit. And, uh, when do you know where they're going to stack up? Is it just, you just have to wait for the fall because everybody's going to be losing people to graduation yeah. and transfer portals and. I mean, is Marquette in a better position a little bit? Because they do, it's, it's almost the Packer model, draft and develop, it's recruit and develop type, type of thing. But when you are able to just sit down and see who is where and where Marquette stacks up, when do you feel like you're going to have a feel for how they're going to do? Or is it, it might be late November when you see how they do in a couple yeah. of tournaments. Yeah, that's the nature of college basketball nowadays. I see all these, you know, Postseason, preseason, top 25, they call them the way too early top 25s that every media outlet has to do because everyone clicks on those sort of things. Uh, but, I mean, it's just impossible to do that these days just because 
the rosters are going to change a week from now. They're going to change dramatically three weeks from now. Um, so I think after, you know, the NBA draft stuff settles out, people go back to college, you get it, you get, you probably have a little more feel for, for rosters, but there still can be some changes. But as far as Marquette, you know, just the way it passes any prologue to what we can expect for under Shaka. I mean, there's not going to be a lot of changes. Um, he's not going to bring in any big name transfers. He's just going to count on guys to get better. Like you said, the, the Packers draft and uh, develop. That's a that's a good analogy for the way that Marquette goes about its business. There were some big injuries. And the first one with the probably the biggest implication was uh, losing Sean Jones in the Butler game because there went the pressure, uh, full court pressure. And uh, mm. Tony Smith made an interesting point last week. He said that now you only have one lockdown defender, Stevie Mitchell. You don't have that mm. other guy that use and i thought that really uh forced shock to turn down the defensive intensity in the half court and made marquette less likely to uh, uh match up with uconn because tristan newton they would always tire him out with pressure and they couldn't do that this year without sean talk about losing sean jones yeah that was a that was a big injury and i think you can see his loss especially against the, the loss to North Carolina State, um, you know, Marquette was mired in a half-court game, not shooting very well, worst shooting night of the season. And I think if you had a guy like Sean Jones in there, he's just that 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 curveball that you can throw in there as a coach that can just dramatically swing the tempo into another direction. Like he could force the force the pace get some turnovers or, or speed the other team up a little bit, make them make some mistakes. And now Marquette's going the other way and maybe can get a couple easy shots that they weren't getting against North Carolina state. Like it was just a, a slug for, for Marquette's offense, just in the half court, not getting in the paint because of the North Carolina's fit North Carolina state's, you know, physicality and their big guys, they weren't getting a lot of easy shots around the rim. So they're just bombing away threes and they were, they just weren't falling. Um, so I think Sean, definitely would have would have changed that just he can he can just change the tempo of a game as soon as he goes in the game and Marquette definitely missed that a lot so what did Marquette learn maybe I mean maybe it could have just been they had a cold shooting night or something like that have you been able to sit down and say okay to make that next step where you're winning multiple games in the NCAA tournament as you watched it as the coaches watched it what do what do you think that they got out of that experience I mean NC State caught lightning in a bottle but a lot of it was the defense because it was something where, well, Marquette had a bad shooting night. Well, Duke also had a bad shooting night when they played NC State. It mm -hmm. could be tied to that. What did they get out of playing a team like that? And how do they take those next steps? Yeah, I think it was definitely Marquette's depth because of the injuries this year uh, really, really sapped their style. Like, like I said, they – to win NCAA tournament games, you got to be able to win multiple different styles. Um, so without a guy like Sean Jones, that change of pace guy, you're really locked into to the way you play. And if another team's taking that away, like what's your counter move? So I think Marquette's can definitely build up its, its depth. So they don't run into that situation again. Just looking at Marquette's recent history over the last seven, eight years. Um, I just don't want to play teams from North or South Carolina, because in 2017, <laughs> you know, look at the, in 2017, Marquette plays a seven South Carolina and they go all the way to the final four. And then in 2022, they play us an eight and nine game with North Carolina and get blown out by 30 points by North Carolina. Yeah. The thing about the NCAA tournament, it's not a six game tournament. You hear people say this, it's not a six game tournament. It's six one game tournaments. Right, because the matchups can change dramatically from from round to round. That's why you need to be able to play different styles, and especially these days, like you said, like if you're playing against 23, 24 year old guys who have been in strength and conditioning programs and at the college level for five years, like their bodies are going to be dramatically different than 18, 19 year old guys. Uh, you know, the younger guys might have some talent, but you know, you if you play guys with more experience or you know, more better physicality, bigger bodies, uh, they can affect the game that way. Um, so I think, it, you know, another thing that Marquette might've learned these last couple of years is just the value of, of having 
a bigger body down low. I think that's why, why you see Marquette brought in a guy like Caden Hamilton last year to red shirt. He's a different type of body than, than the long lean Kirk Queth, Oso Iguodaro, Al Amadou types that that shot could seem to favor a lot, but sometimes you just need like a big banger guy just to throw in there on, on occasion. I think Caden Hamilton has the potential to be that guy. Uh, we'll see at, you know, he's got to show it at the college level. He hasn't played, you know, it's only been in practice at the college level. He's only two years removed from being a kind of a project guy at a California high school, averaging four points a game as a junior. So it's going to take a while for, I think for him to find his feet, but definitely he, he can offer like Sean Jones has a speed change of pace, speed guy. Caden Hamilton can be that, the, you know, that bigger change of body type of guy. And uh, finally, with that, I mean, there's no guarantees in the world of coaching and moving and stuff, but now that it's Shaka Smart's program, it definitely has that feel as there's, you know, a people with coaches everywhere. How big is that, that Shaka Smart uh, definitely has the feel? He's a Marquette guy. He is, it is his program as opposed to the panic is there that other coaches can say, well, you know, he's got these aspirations. He's got these aspirations. Mm -hmm. How big is it that it feels genuine when he talks to a recruit. I'm sticking yeah. around. I'm a Marquette guy as long as as long as they'll have me. Yeah, I think whenever you hear people talk about, you know, Shaka Smart or Marquette, you know, the word fit is always brought up. Alignment, you always hear that. Um, and I think, you know, this isn't a new point of view, but I think Shaka really learned from his te te experience at Texas. Um, what he wanted, what he valued as a coach, how he wants to run the program. He, you know, he wants to draft and develop guys. He wants to, you know, have long-term plans. He doesn't want like the microwave. He says this, he, he uses this phrase a lot as a microwave recruitment and like the transfer portal. He doesn't like doing that. Um, so I think he's found the spot and he's found the success at Marquette that he can point to other people and say, this is how I do it. This is how I want to do it. Um, so yeah, I think it is like, the perfect fit for him. And I think he realizes that. And thanks to Ben Steele for spending time with us. And John, what was your takeaway? And also let's talk a little bit about uh, the website and where people can go to find out more about Marquette Hoops. Well, we always appreciate Ben Steele, his observations. He followed the team from Maui where we saw Purdue and then uh, UConn. And the, so it's a long season and Ben was there every step of the way. And um, our website, markethoops.com, you can get an archive of the show, a left-hand margin. If you want to be included on our newsletter, please drop your email address on the right-hand side in that widget. It might take you two tries. Thank you, John. And uh, be sure to check out the website, but we'll also be sure to salute Moonlight Graham, Modern Dental Benefits, a great supporter of Marquette Hoops. Tom Pippins will be back next week. So... Feel free to celebrate when he gets back here. Thanks so much, and John, thanks to you. Thank you, John.